This is Doug DeMuro, and today I'm going to talk about all the cars that I, Doug DeMuro, have ever owned. All the cars in my car history, I'm going to tell you what they all were, so let's get to it. Before I get started, be sure to check out Cars and Bids, which is my enthusiast car auction website for cool cars from the modern era with free listings. You can list your cool car for free and auction it with no fees on Cars and Bids. And we've had some fantastic sales recently, including this Rivian R1T, which sold for $106,000, this wonderful Mercedes AMG GTS Coupe, which brought $93,000, and this Vanderhall three-wheel roadster thing which sold for just over $35,000. If you're looking to buy or sell a cool enthusiast car from the modern era, Cars and Bids is the place to do it. With daily auctions and great selection, check it out at carsandbids.com. Okay, so time to go down memory lane and talk through all the cars that I have ever owned. Couple of things I wanna make clear before I do this. Number one, I actually did a video on this subject a couple of years ago and named all these cars that I've ever owned that I'm gonna name now in this video. But um, I've had a few more cars since then, so I figured it'd be time for an update. And also, I still get asked a lot, you know, what have you owned, what cars have you had in your past, that sort of thing. And so just to keep it fresh in people's minds, I wanted to bring it up again and go through these cars again just so people know kind of my car history. Also, the other thing I think is important about this video is some car reviewers haven't owned that many cars or have only owned certain cars from a certain brand. And personally, I don't like that. I like a car reviewer who's had like a good solid history of like a lot of different stuff because two things. Number one, it allows them to speak intelligently about a lot of different types of cars because they've owned a lot of different types of cars, but also because you're not, there's no bias. If you have a reviewer who's pretty much only owned Volkswagens and Audis, you kind of wonder, is this person gonna be objective when reviewing a Volkswagen Audi or when reviewing a BMW or like a rival car? But that's not my situation. I've owned everything, as you will see in this video. So let's get started on all the cars that I have owned, going back to my very first car, which was a 1996 Volvo 850 Turbo. This was a very special car when I was in high school. We got it in September of 2004. My parents bought it for me for $6,000 <laughs> and that it was cool. All the 850 turbos sold in the United States had a automatic transmission, but it had a 222 horsepower, 2.3 liter turbo five cylinder and 222 horsepower seemed like all the power to me back in the day. Uh, and it was cool and it was a fun car and I drove it everywhere and I thought I was the fastest car on the road. And back then it was fast. I mean, the new WRX had only 227, you know, like the, it was a pretty quick car. And I enjoyed that car a lot. Eventually I went off to college, didn't have a need for the car anymore and my parents sold it. But that was a very special car and uh, it would kind of started me off in the, in the automotive world, that Volvo 850 Turbo. And by the way, take a look at this picture. This is me going to my first day of junior year in high school, I think. My mom found this picture during COVID. She was bored and looking through old family photos and found this one. There's me with my old 850 Turbo back in the day. Still had good style then, just like I do now. Okay, second car uh, bought in May of 2007 was a 2001 Audi A4. So a B5 A4, not an S4, just a regular A4 with an automatic transmission and the 2.8 liter V6, which was not the, the, you know, the, the 1.8 T was like the cool, fun, sporty engine, even though it had a little less power. The V6 was sort of the more smooth, reliable engine. Had 190 horsepower, and this was not like an amazing performance car, but I loved my B5 A4. And I had that all the way through uh, January of 2010. And what ended up happening with that car was the same thing killed it that killed all of the automatic B5A4s, which was the Tiptronic automatic. It eventually failed as all the Tiptronics did, which was a shame, but also kind of a reality of that car. So that was my second car and I owned that pretty much throughout college. Now that car, as you can see in these pictures, is finished in sort of dark red, maroon, cherry, purplish color. Audi called it hibiscus red pearl. And at the time, I remember thinking that I hated the color because it was such a girly color. You know, I was 18, that, that kind of crap mattered then, you know? Um, 
Over time, that color has become kind of desired in the B5 community because it was weird. It wasn't silver or gray or white or black. It was a weird color. And so that color is kind of a little bit more special and it's, it's interesting to see the love for that color grow a little bit. But that car, uh, I, I eventually, when the transmission died, I sold it. I was trading it in on my next car and I sold it actually to a tech, a technician at the dealership. Um, and he fixed it up, replaced the transmission, I'm sure, and he sold it. And, and I think that car is still on the road driving around in the Houston area. Uh, last time I ran its Carfax, that was a situation with a zillion miles. I really love that car. And I think that owning that B5 really informed my existence in terms of like liking little, that car handled great, had great steering and it was little sized. And I've always loved cars like that ever since then. And I think that car really set me on that path. Okay, next up, my third car was a 2007 Volkswagen GTI. I bought this in January 2010 when the Audi's transmission died. Uh, right when I was graduating from college. Bought this certified pre-owned from a Volkswagen dealership in Atlanta where I was living at the time. And it was a United Gray with the plaid seats and a manual transmission, two-door GTI. Pretty much the most basic car, but it was what I wanted. A stick shift, it was cool. And I enjoyed that thing. It was a fun car. It was neat to have it. And I had it from January of 2010 only until July because at that time I started working for Porsche and uh, corporate headquarters in Atlanta and I had a company car with Porsche. So I had like a 911 as like a 21 year old and I wasn't gonna drive around in this GTI that I, I, you know, I owned, I could sell it and have some money. So I sold it and I drove my 911 company cars. But for six months in there, I had a Mark V GTI that was cool, it was fun, it was a fast car for someone like me. And I really did enjoy it, it was a really cool car. Uh, and I sold that to someone in North Carolina and I think they either still have it or they sold it to one more person. So if you're in North Carolina, United Gray Manual 07 GTI could be mine. Okay, next one uh, was a 1995 Toyota Land Cruiser. I bought this car at a public auto auction doing no mechanical inspection at all. Had 237,000 miles and it was rough, but I bought it for like $1,900 which is incredible, but especially because it had the differential locker, which all the Land Cruiser people were looking for. But bought that car and at the time I was 22, I didn't know anything and I was, it was old. I wasn't used to old cars. It was the oldest car I'd owned and it was so rough and I was always worried it was gonna break. So one day they were predicting a big snowstorm was coming to Atlanta and I was worried that it would like freeze in the snowstorm and then I would never be able to get it started again or something. So I, right before the snowstorm hit, <laughs> I was 21. Right before the snowstorm hit, I went to CarMax and sold it to them. And they, they paid me like four grand for it. I made money on it. Um, but then it got shipped to Africa. So CarMax wholesaled it at an auction and then it, it got sent to Africa where it is now. So that car is long gone, but that was my 80 series Toyota Land Cruiser experience. And I had that from November of 2010 only until January of 2011, just three months. But it kind of started me off on trucks. I got into it. Okay, next car. <laughs> was kind of the beginning of me getting like fun, cool, older cars. And I bought in February of 2011, a 1998 BMW M3 sedan. So this was an M345, so an M3 with four doors and a five-speed manual. This is the only BMW I have ever owned, which I think is crazy. I love a lot of BMWs, but this M3 is the only one I've ever actually owned. Um, it was a cool car, white with a gray interior, like I said, manual transmission, and, and it was good. And I'm glad it, it was good because if it had been unreliable, I'm not sure I would have wanted to per continue pursuing buying, you know, fun older cars. But the S52s were reliable. Um, if I'd bought any other M BMW, it probably would have been an issue. But the S52s were reliable and it was a good car. And I enjoyed that car for most of 2011 uh, and then I sold it on. And that car was eventually involved uh, on Carfax told me in a very serious accident in the Midwest. And it's now in Ohio on like a rebuilt title. Um, but it's still chugging around. Now, I bought that car for like eight grand, sold it for like 10. It was, <laughs> it was uh, a different market for the M3 back then, let's just say. Okay, so my next car after the M3, in the late 2011, I bought a 2001 Mercedes-Benz E55 AMG, a W210 E55, which I loved. Back then, the market on these cars is very different from what it is now. I bought that car from a Honda dealership in Atlanta, still remember the day, went on my lunch break, bought it, um, and I paid like 12 grand for 49,000 mile car. I mean, it was a total, that car probably worth 30 grand today, but that's what, that's what happened. And I loved that car dearly, and I still love it, and I still wish I had kept it, and I still miss it, 
And it's probably the car I most regret selling out of all of my cars. What ended up happening though was I bought my the next car. So the next car was a 1993 Mercedes-Benz 500E. And the 500E is a very special car in the Mercedes-Benz and Porsche world because Porsche built this car. It was a high powered Mercedes-Benz sedan. Mercedes didn't have the production capacity to build it. They farmed it out to Porsche who built it. And so it has this kind of vaunted history as a Mercedes-Benz and a Porsche and it's whatever. So this car listed for sale in a, in a Fiat dealership south of Atlanta for like eight grand with like 70,000 miles. And at the time, even then, that was an absolute bargain. So I went after work, drove down there, bought the car on the spot without even negotiating with them. And there I had now two Mercedes-Benz models, the 500E and the E55. And I didn't really need both, but I was thinking I've just bought this incredibly special 500E. I can't have, you know, that's the one I wanna keep. And so I should keep that and sell the E55, which is, basically what happened more or less. I actually ended up selling the 500E first because people were offering me double what I paid for it. It seemed like it made a lot of sense. So in the end of 2011, I sold the 500E after I only owned it for a couple months and I made double my money, eight grand to 16 grand. Except that now that car, 70,000 mile 500E, I mean, that car probably was worth 60 grand, maybe more. It was a very special car. Um, and at the time it was special too, just the 500E market hadn't taken off like it has now. So I sold the 500E and I was also selling the E55, wanted to try something else. And so I sold the E55 to a lawyer in Atlanta who still owns it and dailies it. And he's at like 150,000 miles now. And I'm so disappointed. It was such a mint car, 50,000 miles. And I wish I had never gotten rid of it, but I did. And I, I think I bought it for like 12, I think I sold it to him for like 9,500 bucks. I mean, it was, it was a different market. So it's important to point out for the next few cars going forward that at the time of this, which was like late 2011, early 2012 in Georgia, you didn't have to pay sales tax on private sale cars, meaning you could buy a car from a private seller, not a dealership, and not pay sales tax. And the result of that is that like your cost is really low because you buy a car for 10 grand or whatever, I was, was most of my cars at the time, and you didn't pay anything except for like insurance and a registration fee. It was like another 200 bucks. And so you could really just buy a car, sell a car, buy a car, sell a car, and not really have any additional costs or anything keeping you from doing that. So throughout this period, I bought and sold a lot of cars since there was no sales tax. The next one was my first like big purchase. I bought a 2006 Lotus Elise in chrome orange. That was in the summer of 2011. I still owned the E55 and the 500E. Um, and I bought that car and I, I drove it across the country. So I bought it in San Jose and Southern, in the Bay Area in California. I was living in Atlanta and I drove it all the way across the country to Atlanta. That was a terrible decision. <laughs> The car didn't have air conditioning that worked, which I didn't know when I bought it. And the seller didn't disclose it, but I also kind of think he didn't know because he's in the Bay Area, you don't need AC a lot there. And, it, but it was a problem when I got into the desert in July in my Lotus Elise. And so I'm driving this thing across country and I, I've told this story before, but this was before I had a YouTube channel or anything. I was just doing this. But I've told this story before, I was driving it and I'm like in Arkansas and in going through the desert in Southern California. And I made several stops at gas stations, not because I needed gas, just to buy water bottles so I could pour them on myself. It was that level of horrid heat in that car. Um, yeah, I got it back to Atlanta. We eventually fixed the air conditioning. But the thing I didn't like about the Elise was that it just was a little too fragile. That's kind of still my problem with that car. I, I, was, I had these Porsche company cars that you could really beat on and have fun with, whatever. The Elise, you were always worried you were gonna like crack the clamshell or damage it in some way. It was just a fragile little car. And it was fun when I got it, when I first had it. And then by the end of the time I owned it, my friends didn't want to ride in it anymore. Nobody really cared. It was, it was time to let it go. So at the end of 2011, I sold that car to a guy locally in Atlanta. And eventually it's made its way to Abilene, Texas. And so there's a chrome orange Lotus Elise in Abilene, probably the only one. And it has a ton of miles on it, like 85,000 miles or something, according to Carfax. So if you're ever in Abilene and you see a chrome orange Lotus Elise, that that was mine. I drove it across the country and uh, some crazy memories from that vehicle. Okay, so next car I had, private seller deal, no sales tax with Lotus. Same deal with the 2004 Cadillac CTS V. I bought a V1, which was the manual transmission V with the six liter V8. It was a cool car in that Darth Vader black. I bought this car off someone who was being deported like that week, like he had lost his job, which was tied to his green card, he had to go. And so like, he didn't have any real negotiating room. So I bought this car like really cheap from him and then paid no sales tax. <laughs> Um, and actually he left his uh, racing helmet in the trunk 
which only now I'm just realizing that he probably was tracking it. But whatever, long gone. Anyway, he left his racing helmet in the trunk and I used that as my racing helmet until like last year. <laughs> so, so thank you to him. Um, but that was my CTSV. I owned that car for a very brief period of time. I bought it cheap. I, it was a cool car actually, and it was reliable and it was fast and had a lot of power. Um, but you know, because I could buy and sell cars without paying any tax, I was just 80, I was like constantly like, okay, this car, this car, this car, next car. And so that car moved on uh, pretty quickly. I sold it to a guy locally in Atlanta, but then um, it made its way up to South Carolina where it was involved in a serious accident. And I think it's still in Columbia, South Carolina right now, but the rear end was like totally redone because it was hit from behind. It's got like LED taillights, that kind of thing. But that was my V. Okay, next car was a 2002 Mercedes-Benz G500. I love the G-Wagon, always have and I wanted one. And I kind of figured out at some point that they weren't depreciating or losing value. And so I went and picked one up. The only problem was the one I bought was incredibly rusty. Um, it, it just was, that was the reality of it. It had, it had spent its original like 10 years in Provincetown, Massachusetts, which is at the very tip of Cape Cod, and it got rusty. And that was, that's the problem with G-Wagons in general is that they rust and this one was bad. And so when I discovered the rust after I already bought the car, I realized that it was just a disaster. I didn't really want it to sell it to anybody so I sold it to CarMax who then took it and wholesaled it. The crazy thing about the G-Wagon was that after I owned it, um, I keep track of all my cars and their VINs with Carfax as you can probably tell. After I owned it, CarMax sold it to someone in Alabama and then they sold it to someone else and eventually it made its way to Tampa where it was involved in a fatal hit and run accident. The person driving the car crashed into two people who were crossing the road late at night, killed them both and took off. And um, it, crazy. And there are security tapes of my old G-Wagon. It was years after I owned it, but there are security tapes of my old G-Wagon hit, you know, hitting the people, taking off. Uh, crazy story. And that's that. I think that car is still, the police still have that car. Okay, next one, uh, next car I had was a 2001 Porsche 911 Turbo. This is back when you could get a 996 Turbo for 30 grand, and indeed I did. So I bought this car uh, from a private seller in Florida who didn't disclose to me that it needed a new clutch. And crazily enough, I had a pre-purchase inspection done at a Porsche dealer and they missed that it needed a new clutch. So I'm driving it home and I'm like, the, the revs are going up when I accelerate. I'm like, I don't know what's going on here. It needed a clutch. The good news was I worked for Porsche at the time. So I got a 996 clutch for cost and then I had a local dealer do it or whatever. But um, at the time I was really upset. Like I can't believe I paid another two grand for a clutch. I, little did I know I had just bought a 996 turbo for 30 grand. And I was now into it for 33, but <laughs> that kind of soured me on the car. And after that, I was always nervous it would have some problem. Even though now I know that 996 turbos are like the most reliable 911s and, I should have kept it and, and now that would be a 50 or $60,000 car, but I bought it for 30. I was in it for maybe 33, 34. I sold it to a guy for 30. Um, and that car has kind of kicked around here and there. And it comes up for sale every couple years. And when it does, um, people Google the VIN and they find the ad that I put on Renlist to sell it like in 2012. And they're like, this car was formerly owned by Doug DeViro. And it's like, yeah, that was my car. Uh, and it's, that is indeed true. And so I own that car in Atlanta and my understanding is that it moved out of the state, but it's now back in Atlanta now. So there's a black 996 turbo with a stick shift 01 with the front bumperettes that were only on the first original cars. Uh, it was mine. Okay, next car I had, I really wanted to get a Mercedes AMG station wagon. And so at the time, it was 2012, the only ones that I could afford were the original, which was the E55, which came out in 2003 or five as a wagon, and then the E63, which came out in 07. So I set search alerts on Auto Trader, like desperate to find one of these wagons. It was like what I had set my mind I really wanted. And a search alert pops up for one in Indiana, uh, an E63 in 07. And it was pewter gold. Um, but it was the only one available. They only made like 190 of the E55s and like 150 of the E63s. So they were much rarer then than they are now. These days, the E63 wagon is like half of E63 sales, but back then it was like 1 12th or something. So um, I called the guy right away and he said, hey, listen, I, I sold this, I'm, I'm selling this car, but I, I put it on our trader and then I, I've just gone on a flight to Hawaii. And I'm like, why did you do that? <laughs> But yeah, he said, but I'll be back in a few weeks and I've gotten a bunch of calls, but you're the first and, and I'll hold it for you if you pay me full ask. So I did. And, and I, he waited, Trudeau's already waited two weeks and I flew up to Indiana 
And I bought the car and I drove it back home and I had this E63 wagon, which was the coolest thing in the world. And this was about 2012. And I loved that car. And that was like the first really cool, special, like valuable, and the, the Lotus at least too, but like valuable modern car that I had. And it was a really neat car. And that was a very special vehicle. Interesting story about that car. Um, I got hit in it twice, for one thing. I was hit at a stoplight by a drunk driver. Um, it was low speed, but it did a lot of damage to the car. I was fine. And all that. Um, but I fixed it, whatever. And then I sold it to a guy in Dallas named Doug also, who I am still in touch with. He emails me every so often. Um, very nice dude. The crazy thing though is Doug eventually, he had, for, he had it for like five years, put his kids in it, I mean, that sort of thing. He eventually replaced it, I think, with a Panamera and he sold it. And I'm walking down the street last year in Atlanta where I owned it. And there it is, <laughs> sitting there, parked in front of a house. And I had known because I car faxed it that it had come back to Atlanta, but I'm like, I happen upon my old car. Like it was insane. And so I have these pictures, which you're seeing now of me standing next to the car that I had owned like 10 years earlier, completely random walking down the street. Uh, and that was a crazy experience. Nothing like that has ever happened again. An amazing coincidence. But that car obviously is back in Atlanta now. It's actually in my favorite neighborhood in Atlanta, Inman Park. And it's my old, my old E63 wagon, special car. Okay, next car, I had a 1995 Range Rover, a Range Rover Classic in the green that these all should have been. Uh, this is a long wheelbase car. 95 was the last year, so the most special year. Very desirable and special car. Unfortunately, uh, I, this car caused so many problems. It was a disaster. It stranded me three times. It was just an absolute nightmare. It got to a point where I was parking it a certain way in case I needed to put it on a tow truck. It was a nightmare. So eventually I sold this car also to a guy in Dallas, and what a mistake. I, I bought the car for maybe 11, I sold it for like eight, um, put money into it. But now a 95 Range Rover Classic, this was a nice restored, good car. It, it probably would be worth $25,000. Uh, and I liked it, and I, I, I wish I hadn't sold that. And the guy I sold to still owns it, but that was a cool car, and I, and I missed my Range Rover Classic, and it was problematic, but I wish I had just like powered through it a little bit more, found a specialist who could address its needs a little better. But I didn't, and that was that. Okay, my next car after that Range Rover was a 2006 Range Rover. And now we're getting into kind of my public era. This, I bought that car in December of 2012, and I owned it until very recently, 10 years basically. Um, and that car I bought from CarMax, and that was kind of the car that kicked off my career doing this. Um, I was writing about it, and I was writing about the fact that I had bought it with this crazy warranty that CarMax sold me, and you know they sold me a warranty for like 3,500 bucks, and I eventually got like $28,000 in repairs out of this warranty, and that that was cool. And and I bought that car kind of the day I quit my day job to do this, and it provided what I just I didn't know what the time it would, but it provided an enormous amount of content that allowed me to kind of get popular writing about all of its problems and all of the warranty claims that CarMax was paying for. So that, that was a cool experience. Um, and, and that car really did kind of help jumpstart my career in a very special way, which I didn't know when I was buying it uh, that would happen, but, um, but it did. And I, I was very well known for that car for a long time. Now, modern new viewers to my channel don't know anything about that, but, but at the very beginning in 2012, 13, 14, that was my thing. And even through 2015, I was still like, I made a few videos about all the warranty claims. And um, that was like a big deal for me and for the, the beginnings of my career. So after that car, it's important to point out that a lot of the cars are cars that you may already know about. I, I, the next car was a 2001 Toyota Prius that I bought off a friend who was moving to New York City and didn't have anything to do with it. So I bought it from him for nothing and I resold it to some kid in Nashville. And then I had a 2009 Nissan Cube, which is another car that I inherited from my brother. He moved across the country, didn't want to take that with him. And so I got the Cube, sold that quickly. But after that, it's kind of cars that were on my channel. Uh, the next one was a 2011 Cadillac CTS V Wagon, which was the very first video I ever did. When I was selling my V Wagon, I put the video up and, and that was like my farewell to that car was the first YouTube video that I ever did. Uh, and that car I sold to a kid in Houston, I think, maybe also Dallas, uh, who crashed it. He fell asleep at the wheel one night, late at night, long road, fell asleep, hit a tree. Uh, car, he was okay. 
the car was destroyed beyond recognition. Uh, so one V-Wagon gone for sure. But after that, basically every other car on this list kind of got somewhat famous on my YouTube channel doing various stupid pursuits. The next one was a 2004 Ferrari 360, which I bought at the start of 2014. And I did a lot of videos with that car. And that car, still to this day, some people come up to me on the street and say, hey, I've been following you since the 360. That's like OG. That was like I had 100,000 subscribers or like 50,000 subscribers and I was just trying to grind and make videos. And I had bought, I'd taken out a massive loan to buy this Ferrari hoping that it would make sense financially, which of course it did. Back then, there weren't a lot of people on YouTube making videos with supercars. It was kind of a novel thing. Some guy on the internet has a Ferrari. Like in 2014, that was a truly a big deal. There was nobody else out there except for Salamandran who was making these like, now every, you know, Stradman has a Veyron, like you, you, everyone has cool cars. But at that time, that was a really, really, really big deal. And I got a lot of traffic because it was like, wow, here's like a real person telling me what it's like to own a Ferrari. Um, and those videos did well. And after that, it kind of, you know, there were other YouTube cars. I had a Nissan Skyline GTR, I made a lot of videos with that, right-hand drive, went through the drive through backwards, that whole thing. I had a uh, Hummer, I had a 1995 Hummer, AM General Hummer H1 which was a disastrously problematic car, but it was fun and it was interesting. And I had to tow it off South Street in Philadelphia once because it broke down. It broke down a couple of times, I think. I eventually sold that Hummer to a guy in New Hampshire. And he told me that he wanted to use it to like just kind of cruise around his town. He like lived near the coast, like near Portsmouth. And he just wanted to like cruise around his town, take his kid to get ice cream, whatever. I sold him that car 10 years ago and I Carfax it and he still owns it. And I guess he's, that's that. He's still got it. And, and I hope he's having fun with it. My old gas powered Hummer. Of course, the next car everybody remembers my 2007 Aston Martin V8 Vantage. That was the car where I famously talked about how I had a bumper to bumper warranty and made a big thing about that, which apparently caused an enormous amount of strife in Aston Martin. Years later, I found out that Aston Martin had this big, who told him? it was a bumper to bumper warranty. <laughs> oh, it was funny, but the truth is the car was actually pretty reliable. Um, that car, because it had this warranty, it had a one year, so short term, but an unlimited mileage warranty that basically was bumper to bumper. And, and it had a few problems right at the start, but after we kind of got them solved, the car was flawless. I took that car to 34 US states. I took it to Canada twice, DC. Uh, I got a picture of it next to a bison in North Dakota, which I, is one of my crowning achievements because I'm probably the only Aston Martin owner who has that. It was a very, very, very special. I drove it, I took it to my fan meetups, which I did in the summer of 2016. Um, I drove that car everywhere. Eventually I sold it to Tavarish, who's another car YouTuber, and he's sold it on, and where is it now? It's actually in Atlanta. So another one of my cars that ended up in Atlanta, maybe I'll see it on the road randomly someday too. But that V8 Vantage, I, I think that to an extent, I might actually be a little bit responsible for the recent rise in V8 Vantage prices. I don't think I have much effect on the car market in terms of prices, but this one maybe because I think I kind of debunked the myth that these cars were unreliable. I had nothing but an easy time with mine. I drove almost 20,000 miles in a single year across the country. I mean, it was no big deal. And that car was great. And I think people realized like, hey, wait a minute, this car is not that unreliable. And they've started buying them. And after that, prices started creeping up and up. And now they're pretty expensive. After that, I had a 1997 Dodge Viper GTS, which of course was covered on the channel a lot. That was a very special car. I really enjoyed it. I sold it to like a car collector in Northern New Jersey. Uh, I had a 1989 Nissan S Cargo, which I loved deeply, missed that car so much. I sold that car to a guy who ran a pizza place in Kansas and he decked it out to like represent his pizza place. It was called AJ's Pizza and he owned it for a while and like it would deliver pizzas in it. And of course it was a weird looking car. So it was advertising for his business and that was cool. When we launched Cars and Bids at the start of 2020, he auctioned that car with Cars and Bids. It didn't sell, but we did sell it after to the high bidder who was like a state Senate candidate in Pennsylvania. And he took off the pizza graphics and put on his like state Senate campaign graphics and used it for for that purpose, I saw some pictures. I don't know what happened to that car now, but I would love to have it back. My, my old like, Nissan S Cargo. Um, after that, it really is cars I've covered a lot on the channel. 97 Land Rover Defender 90, my yellow Defender, which is of course a car I've loved. Uh, my 2012 Mercedes E63 wagon, which I own, was my daily driver. And that was the first car we sold on Cars and Bids 7,000 auctions ago. Um, obviously this car was next, my 2005 Ford GT, which I still own and love. And then my Mercedes G500 Cabriolet, which is probably my favorite car I've ever owned, as I mentioned in this video where I talk about why I love it so much and how much. Then after that, I sold the E63 wagon on cars and bids, needed a replacement daily driver, so I bought a Kia Stinger, uh, which I loved that Kia Stinger. And I really, 
think about that car a lot and the way that it drives and how I loved how it drove and I loved how the handling was good. The engine was really responsive. I miss that car a lot. Um, it got sold on Cars and Bids also to a guy who's in the Midwest, in the Milwaukee area. And he, he liked it, he wanted it because it was all wheel drive, practical, and it's a cool car. I, that car, I, just today, it's announced that rumors are that Kia is canceling it, which is of course a surprise to exactly nobody. Um, but I really enjoyed that car and I, and I miss it. After that, I bought my Audi RS2 Avant, which is a very special car. I've really loved having that, my, the first Audi RS car. Then uh, my new Land Rover Defender replaced the Kia Stinger, and I've had that now. It's been my daily driver for the last couple of years, and uh, I got like 32,000 miles on it. And then I just recently, a couple months ago, bought a Toyota Land Cruiser, which lives on the East Coast that I also use. So there you go. That's my automotive history. All these cars. It, is, it, it comes out to 32 vehicles now, and I'm 34 years old. So that's a lot of cars. <laughs> but the thing that I really like about this, the point that I want to make whenever I do this video and talk about the, my car history is I've had it all. I've had everything. I've had cars from all the countries. I've had Swedish, Korean, Japanese, American, German, British, all of it. Um, Land Rover, Ford, General Motors, two Cadillacs, everything, everything. And so I really do have like a very generalist approach to cars. I like all cars. I like all cars. I like to check them out, enjoy them, drive them. Doesn't matter to me if it's a Japanese automatic car, an American manual car, a V8, an electric, a hybrid. I like them all. And I think that's really reflected in my car taste. And I think that's really reflected in my reviews also. I very rarely get accused of you got paid by so-and-so or you have a pro whatever brand bias because I think I'm really clear that I like them all and I'm into them all. And that's proven in my car ownership history, which you now know.